October 6, 1909 Boston Evening Transcript Boston, Massachusetts Occultism and Science Fresh Interest in the Subject in France The Various Societies Now Conducting Experiments Victorian Sardou not only versed in the mysteries of spiritism, he was a medium as well. How modern chemistry and physics today touch on matters once the hobby of the alchemist. Occultism, a house of many mansions, including spiritism, hypnotism, prophecy, astrology, all these being actively studied by Pierre Piobe, translated from La Review. Occultism will be the science of the 20th century, cried Colonel de Rochat a score of years ago. The assertion was perhaps premature, perhaps even exaggerated. Nevertheless, it showed the zeal of those who today are recognized as precursors. At that time, in 1888. Certain rather paradoxical spirits dared to pry into medieval books that were no longer read. There they found unsuspected metaphysical systems, forgotten physical theories, and neglected sciences. They published their discoveries. Till then, this body of knowledge had remained the property of the few, it had been described as a cult and despised accordingly. Scientists regarded occult science as mere superstition. The public regarded it as antique error. But when the occultists opened those dusty tomes, they believed that they had recovered a buried science. The world was at the time ready to welcome the marvelous. Spiritism had begun to enter the experimental stage and had enlisted the interest of Sir William Crookes. In 1868, Allan Kardec's doctrines had won numerous converts. Everybody took to table tipping. Toward 1888, the spiritist circles became veritable little churches. Meanwhile, Hindu ideas were filtering into Europe. Theosophy got a foothold, spreading the taste for mystery and the study of psychic phenomena. Finally, Charcot gave hypnotism its scientific basis. So, in 1888, the time was rife for the revival of forgotten or despised sciences. But till then, these sciences had been the possession of secret societies persecuted by the Catholic Church, scorned by scientists, and ridiculed by the public. They remained the property of close corporations. When the precursors discovered them, they were a revelation. The movement of 1888 was eminently esoteric. Peladan and Stanislas de Waita founded the Rose Croix and Pappas restored the Martinist order. The result was a very pronounced metaphysical tendency, and the scientific side was somewhat neglected. Nevertheless, the movement had got its start. People began to risk one eye. They no longer held wholly aloof. Books appeared. Several ancient treatises on alchemy and astrology were reprinted, Little by little, a suspicion arose that science had not yet said its last word. Mysticism gave room to positivism, and today the study of the forgotten wisdom has entered a new phase, that of rationalism and experimentation. Today, occultism is a familiar word, not very clearly understood, but used without prejudice. Yet, the majority of the public means by occultism an ensemble of the researches into psychical phenomena. The term is used in that sense by Dr. Grasset, 
professor at the University of Montpellier, and his book treats only of the supernatural doings attributed to spirits. Says Grasset, occultism is not the study of all that is hidden from science. It is the study of facts that do not as yet belong to science, but which may belong to it some day. All branches of science contain mysteries. Biology cannot explain heredity. Chemistry cannot explain affinity. Physics cannot explain heat or light or electricity or even gravity. Everywhere survives the unknown. That unknown is the domain of occultism. The old savants, like our modern ones, proceeded only by hypotheses, but they were perhaps more anxious about the facts that eluded them than their successors are. They were less practical and more theoretical. Well, since the discovery of X-rays, we poke less fun than formerly at medieval philosophers' cold fire. So occultism undertakes to get at the elusive reasons back of facts that now remain unexplained by savants. According to Grasset, occultism is the promised land of science. And this is the sense in which the term should be taken today. Looked at in this way, contemporary occultism is not a science. It is not an ensemble of sciences. It is a tendency. Occultists are more numerous than is generally supposed, though many of them never think of calling themselves such. For instance, a Moisson who discovers the artificial diamond is really an alchemist. The domain most studied by present-day occultists is that of psychic phenomena. You are familiar with the ensemble of facts set forth. Monsieur Flammarion has recounted a lot of them, while Monsieur Boirac, rector of the Académie de Dijon, has tried to classify them in his learned volume, La Psychologie en Connu. First come the phenomena of hypnotism and suggestion. Science no longer poo-poos them. Following the ideas of Charcot and Rochat, it is recognized that man can, by an exercise of will, affect the mind of a fellow mortal. The discussion confines itself to the modus and the rationality of that performance. Next come facts more or less related to animal magnetism. Animal magnetism represents an old hypothesis given new life by Mesmer. It assumes that man has the power to emit a sort of current and to communicate it to animals, plants, and even minerals. From it result various phenomena, thought transmission, transmission of sensation, and projection of sensibility, motivity, etc. The hypothesis seeks to explain mind reading, also the faculty by which we sometimes dream of things that subsequently come to pass. Finally, there are facts of mediumship, such, for instance, as the moving of objects at a distance without contact. These phenomena occur either without revealed mediums, in the case of haunted houses, or with the medium recognized, in the case of spiritualistic sciences, to say nothing of the comings and goings of luminous phantoms. As a first step, the facts are discussed. Are they realities or mere humbugs? Experimentation here is very difficult. We are forced to employ mediums, and mediums are not over-endowed with honesty. Last winter, Dr. Grasset offered a prize to any medium who, under the most exacting conditions, would move an object without touching it. No one tried for the prize. The truth is this. A real medium, and there are many real mediums, could have won it. But where is the real medium who can be sure of commanding mediumistic power 
at a previously appointed moment. All experimenters know that the power is intermittent. The real reason mediums resort to humbug at times is that at times they have no other resource. So when no one tried for the Le Bon Prize, was it fair to conclude that all mediums were frauds? Many cases have been cited, notably the Via Carmen affair, in which it is claimed that Dr. Richet was gloriously duped. But the argument is not worth much. Not all mediums are humbugs. Several of them are above suspicion, especially those who operate in private and don't try to make money out of their power or gain notoriety. Such a medium was the lamented Victorian Sardou. Still, the discussion has proved that scientific observation in this realm demands very vigorous methods. Yet research is going forward undaunted. The Institut General Psychologique, which includes in its membership such scientists as Monsieur Darson Val and Branley and Mademoiselle Curie, keeps on experimenting. The Société Universelle d'Études Psychologiques, under Dr. Joire, is equally active. And so are the Société Magnétique de France, the Société Psychique de Nancy, the Milan Societa di Studi Psychiale, the London Society for Psychical Research, and several other scientific associations in Vienna, New York, Melbourne, etc. Never, perhaps, was spiritism so much studied as today, but never with less of preconceived theory. Spirits are purely theoretical, an assumption that the facts of mediumship represent an agent outside the medium, i.e. an entity, that has vanished from the world. The theosophists call this outside agent a being belonging wholly to the other world, an angel or demon, if you like. Pappus seems to have held that view. Grasset, Boirac, and Richet prefer to regard the agent as within the medium, as one of his personal faculties. And there are many other hypotheses. Which is the best? At present, one has no right to say, we must wait. Alongside psychism, properly so-called other branches of occultism are greatly interesting the savants. One of the first to consider is the art of prophecy. Prophets have always existed. They still exist. The slightest presentiment must be regarded as a species of divination. Divination is a fact, and every fact deserves scientific study. Here, experimentation is much easier than in psychism. There has been a real prophecy when a subject has predicted an event which no one could foresee. The explanation involves neither telepathy nor suggestion, nor unconscious or subconscious memory, nor any other psychological cause. We must have recourse to very different hypotheses in order to explain the modus. There are two principal ways of giving a prophecy, as is learned by carefully examining ancient books. The first is the subjective method. The subject simply describes what he sees or feels. Without entering into any sort of trance, he simply closes his eyes and describes a vision. Of course, these data are vague, often they are false, Yet if sometimes they are true, science is justified in seeking their natural and logical causes. Certain investigators, among them Baron de Navajo, have undertaken to catalog ancient prophecies that have come true. To be sure, the work involves its difficulties. Lots of prophecies have failed to antedate the alleged fulfillment. Let the occultist beware. No real satisfactory theory has as yet been found to explain subjective prophecy. The metaphysically inclined occultists generally attribute it to an entity outside the mind. Scientific psychists, on the other hand, are prone to suspect 
that it results from a special sense possessed by the prophet. The method of objective prophecy is still more extraordinary. It employs geomancy and cards, or falls back upon astrology. The card method is familiar. Papus, Oswald Wirt, Eud Picard, and other patient students have found that the bizarre figures painted on the cards were symbolic. If an operator let fall several of these cards haphazard upon a table, their symbol, representation, would apply to a future event. The cards are read by fixed rules, leaving the smallest possible field for the play of individual imagination. The predictions thus arrived at are frequently astonishing. Try it yourself and you will be surprised. Back of it all is a fact, a fact to be accounted for. The metaphysically minded class it among the facts of mediumship. One may doubt their judgment, though, for one can tell fortunes with cards without being a medium. The same with geomancy, a method of divination well known to the Arabs. The operator traces a number of points haphazard upon the paper. Then he assembles these points so as to make certain conventional, symbolic figures. This he does in obedience to fixed rules. Finally, he interprets the symbols in obedience to rules likewise fixed. Spiritists, theosophists, and even psychists agree in calling the performance a manifestation of mediumship. But the more positive scientists think it only the work of chance. Yet how comes it that often the method reveals the unknown future? The problem of chance is exceedingly difficult. It interests both the philosopher and the mathematician. In the last analysis, chance seems not to exist. It is a word that explains nothing. Every phenomenon has, necessarily, a cause, and chance is only the expression of an unknown cause or of a multitude of causes that elude us, as Monsieur Henri Poincaré has so ably affirmed. So the facts of divination by cards and geomancy are being carefully studied, experimented with, analyzed, and classified. The explanation is being sought. As like as not, it will be found, since already we have rediscovered the worth of a forgotten and despised science, astrology. Astrology claims to afford the means of knowing the past, present, and future. No science was ever more furiously cried down. It has for two centuries been so hooted that, until lately, nobody dared go near it. And yet all the great astronomers were astrologists. Kepler, Tycho Brahe, Newton, and ever so many others. But you know the amusing story about Faye. One day, a modest investigator went to the Bureau of Longitudes to ask for a bit of information not to be found in the annuaries. The celebrated astronomer welcomed him cordially and asked, Why do you want this information? Astronomers, even amateurs, overlook it. I am studying astrology, replied the visitor, a little confused. Studying astrology, cried Fay. Well, you can afford to confess it. As for myself, my position compels me to keep my mouth shut. Though astrologist has long been a synonym for charlatan, it may yet become respectable. The first move toward its rehabilitation was made in the Le Verrier Laboratory, by Monsieur François-Charles Barlet, one of the precursors of 1888. Next to psychism, this branch of occultism is the most studied today. In certain respects, it may be called more advanced than all the rest. It owes its progress to the great strides made by astronomy in our time. The movements of the stars are much better known to us than they were to the ancients, and the means of calculation are much more exact in their results. A large number of mathematicians, former students at the École Centrale or the Sorbonne, all of them sound scientists, are going at the problem with unwearying zeal. 
they have already published pretty nearly a whole library about it. Astrology is based upon the following hypothesis. Nature is always and everywhere like to herself. The same causes produce the same effects always. So we have a right to expect that a restricted realm like the world we inhabit possesses its raison d'etre in a vaster universe, namely the solar system. Accordingly, we shall find the reason for the form of the Earth, its continents and its seas in the combined play of cosmic forces. There we shall also find the reason for the distribution of animal and vegetable species, and finally, the reason for the destiny of every individual. Certain astrologists declare that statistics prove that human beings of one family are always born under astral dispositions sensibly alike, hence the legitimacy of the study of those astral dispositions. Astronomers admit that the planets and our satellite, the moon, influence one another sufficiently to disturb one another's movements. They can calculate such perturbations. They can account for tides only by attributing them to lunar influences. It is true, then, that the stars affect terrestrial phenomena. Astrologists believe that their influence produces general determinism and, consequently, human determinism. A priori, there is nothing absurd about their theory. The point is only to see if it works. Between this science and that of certain fortune tellers, there is nothing in common beyond a name. The occultist's sole purpose is to get at the scientific truth that may underlie a department of knowledge which, having been hitherto neglected, has often fallen prey to charlatans. The astrological soothsayers have sometimes made out to draw right conclusions from their horoscopes. This is what has induced certain savants to investigate. But it requires a vast knowledge of mathematics and astronomy, even to get at the modus of astral determinism. The remarkable works of Monsieur Charles-Henri, the Sorbonne Laboratory Director, have thrown much light upon astrological methods. An associate of his has published L'Induction Electromagnétique des Astres, which produced a sensation and was the center of several controversies. Astrology has entered upon its scientific phase Alchemy follows closely. Since the discovery of X-rays, Hertzian waves, and radioactivity, since the work of the dissociation of matter, in short, since Renchen, Hertz, Branley, Curie, Becquerel, and Lebon, we may say that physics is turning to alchemy and to magic. Our ideas of matter and forces and currents are considerably modified. A whole new world has opened out before us. We are only upon the threshold, but already we perceive that the theories of the old philosophers opened the doors long ago. The work of our scientists will doubtless be in perfecting those theories and making them demonstrable by experiment. The practical results will come then. The experiments of Sir William Ramsay in the transmutation of certain metals those of Verneuil, Bordas, and Moisan in the artificial production of precious stones, those of Madame Curie in radioactivity, those of Becquerel in the properties of ions and electrons, those of Muscar in terrestrial magnetism, and those of Yves Delage in artificial generation, all have their relation to the subject Physics and chemistry are probably moving on toward a realm of knowledge believed impossible before our day and absolutely chimerical. On the other hand, we are beginning seriously to study the ancient treatises of forgotten medieval savants, of those of Greco-Latin times, and even of India and China. There is certainly much to glean in the voluminous writings of those old thinkers, Marceline Berthelot and J.B. Dumas understood this perfectly. Instead of despising the alchemists, they read them reverently. The misfortune is that those ancient savants spoke a symbolic language hard to understand. 
Often a busy man of science lacks time to study old texts. He needs someone to help him in that direction. That is why there have been founded associations like the Société Alchimique de France, presided over by the learned Monsieur Jolivet Castelot, and the Société de Sciences Anciennes, which contains in its membership mathematicians, chemists, physicians, exegetes, archaeologists, philosophers, and even adepts in heraldry. These associations burrow in old libraries for vanished documents, bringing to light long-forgotten lore. Their work will be useful. A multitude of Chinese, Hindu, Egyptian, Greek, and Latin treatises have never been read. Several have been translated, but at a time when rationalism was unknown and experimental science was in its babyhood. Consequently, grave errors have been spread abroad concerning the religions of the past, the philosophical and scientific learning of the past, and also the morals of the past. Mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, physics, biology, therapeutics, ethnology, linguistics, hierology, history, and even sociology have everything to gain from the tendencies of contemporary occultism. We have seen that occultism touches almost all branches of human knowledge. It is not a science, but it is a way of understanding sciences and stimulating their progress.